Welcome to rounds. <laughs> I will go ahead and start. This is a 13-year-old neutered male Yorkie with history of bilateral phaco emulsification um, for chronic diabetic hypermature cataracts. Uh, this is the left eye, uh, which obviously didn't do well after surgery. The other eye is doing well. Uh, they said they were unable to place an IOL due to lens capsule rupture. Um, that uh, And then this eye had chronic persistent uveitis that progressed to endophthalmitis and suspected panophthalmitis with secondary glaucoma. At enucleation, they noted a scleral rupture, and then they took a uh, swab of all this intraocular goo uh, for culture and sensitivity, um, which we did not get the results of. But anyway, so the dog is diabetic, has had chronic urinary tract infections. It has reduced retinal function and systemic hypertension. So back to our, ah, our gross photo. Sorry, pardon me. Um, so what we noticed was the eye, the globe was slightly, slightly collapsed and a, an extensive dorsal limbal uh, scleral defect was noted. Um, we noted rounded ends on this defect, which is indicative of a true or maybe perhaps longstanding scleral rupture as opposed to something iatrogenic that happened during surgery. Um, we were unable to identify a lens capsule, um, but remember they did not put an IOL in. Uh, but we couldn't identify the lens capsule at all. Um, all of the ocular chambers contain varying amounts and uh, sort of types of exudates. So we've got more of a solid separative exudate here. The anterior chamber contains a lot of hemorrhage um, and maybe some fibrin in this area. And then um, at the back here, um, the, the vitreous itself is probably condensed all up in here with this exudate. The retina is right here, and it is probably detached, certainly detached in this area, and kind of thickened and off-white. And then there's this um, supra-choroidal sort of uh, off, well, kind of brownish gel. So now that we've covered all of that twice, for those who are here in person, let's go to our... Ooh, and that's the wrong face. Just kidding. All right. So looking much like the gross photo, um, here's that uh, limbal rupture. Um, once again, the lens capsule is very difficult to see. Uh, there's some of that hemorrhage and fibrin in the anterior chamber. The, the iris is actually sort of difficult to make out, but this is one arm of the iris right there. The other one is up in here somewhere. Uh, you can see uveal tissue kind of extending right up to that defect. And then at the back and in the middle, there's that uh, vitriol exudate. And then the retina is all along here, which I will show you now. So there is that uh, limbal scleral defect. Uh, you can see all this exudate um, that has hemorrhage in it. So a separative exudate. Um, with hemorrhage and fibrin that's sort of uh, inside the eye and wrapping around the defect. Um, the sclera on the other side is present right there. And it's kind of rounded and kind of expanded and edematous, and there's hemorrhage. When we move back into the episclera, the orbital tissues are expanded by a spindle cell population with some hemorrhage. So we've got some fibroplasia, and there's probably some inflammation in there as well. Um, so as I said on the subgross view, here's the iris leaflet, and you can see um, here is the ciliary body. Right in there is the indestructible collagen of the ciliary body that's still present. Um, and you can see that uh, the ciliary body is prolapsing out that scleral defect and is probably necrotic. When we move a little bit more into the anterior chamber, um, we can see decimase membrane present right here. And remember we said that the defect was dorsal. So this is the dorsal side of the globe. So decimus membrane is here and then it's discontinuous right there. And this is consistent with um, the typical location for a cataract surgery, which is dorsal. So they make that incision dorsally. Um, so there's that break in decimus membrane and it picks up again right here. Now, you might be noticing something a little bit weird here. 
Um, so there's that blunt end in decimase. This is corneal stroma, which is vascularized, and there are a few neutrophils in it. And we have um, a few spindle cells uh, mixed in here. So there's a little bit of fibroplasia and vascularization of the corneal stroma in the area of the incision, which is typical. Um, but what is not typical and rather unfortunate in this case is we have these layers of stratified squamous epithelium that are present on the inside of the globe. So you can see here's that end of decimase membrane. Uh, we've got this nice stratified squamous epithelium that's extending along um, onto the inside of uh, the backside of decimase membrane, so in the anterior chamber. So presumably this is corneal epithelium that has migrated through the surgical defect uh, or surgical incision into the anterior chamber. Um, obviously, we don't have um, that exact area of where the epithelium got through, or it has, or it got through initially, and then it kind of healed up. It's hard to say what exactly what happened. We, I did not go deeper on this one. I like that knob pointing down. Mm -hmm. The knob with the dicky. Yeah, right here. Yeah, yep. on the on the surface. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like that will connect at some point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um. So, if um. In general, I would say that this means that there was poor wound healing of the surgical incision. Um, and it's very possible that if in another plane of section, if this surface epithelium really created an entire channel through the corneal stroma, that unfortunately provides a really great way for bacteria to get into the eye. Um, so we'll get to that in a sec, but the anterior chamber contains a lot of fibrin and hemorrhage. And you can see that stratified squamous epithelium is migrating all over the place and sort of on the uh, surface of the fibrin. It's present over here as well on the other side of the eye. Um, the cornea is also broadly ulcerated at this point. Um, so I was going to say something really profound. Um, said a bunch of profound things already. <laughs> uh, maybe we'll get there. Anyway, um, the 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 uh, border of the iris is really difficult to make out. So there's kind of loose granulation tissue or membrane formation all the way around the iris, um, possibly with some irritable necrosis as well. Uh, anyway, so let's move back into the eye. And um, so there's uh, the lens capsule, nice and thick there. Um, so that's the anterior lens capsule. And remember, they noted uh, lens capsule rupture, which is why they didn't put an eye well in. And so here's the wrinkled up, most likely discontinuous uh, posterior lens capsule. We know it's posterior because it's thinner. And then here's a really convincing end of lens capsule right there. Um, so there's a lot of uh, viable and degenerate neutrophils around. So there's definitely a separative. Oh, man, maybe they're all degenerate. Anyway, suppurative endophthalmitis. Um, and in the back here, um, these purple blobs are asteroid bodies. So there's asteroid hylosis present. Um, you can see that there are some inflammatory cells inside the lens capsule, which is maybe not surprising given what's going on everywhere. So as we look back here, um, most of these guys are all those asteroid bodies that are kind of mingling with the fibrinosuppurative exudate. However, when we go back a little bit further, we've got some larger, darker purple blobs. And when we go higher mag on these guys, um, they are in fact composed of myriad, very large cocci, I think. At least that's what I thought it was on my scope. Um, so more than likely, given the size and the shape, I thought these were probably Staphylococcus uh, bacteria. Um, anyway, so there we go. And so you can see those all those dark purple spots all the way back here are all bacterial colonies. So this, this eye was very much colonized. Um, as we move back, here is the optic nerve. Here's the optic nerve head. Here's the retina. You can see that we have some recognizable retinal layers. And then at least in this area, ventrally here, the retinal layers just disappear. And that's just consistent with retinal necrosis. So you can just see how it just kind of goes away. And so that's all retinal necrosis. Um, when the retina is really a foregone conclusion, um, one of the more recognizable ways of knowing where it was, was looking for naked blood vessels. So here's a blood vessel here, uh, and it's surrounded by a very necrotic retina. 
And it, the same is true on this side. Uh, here, it's a, still a little bit more recognizable, but it is expanded by hemorrhage and fibrin. And there's also hemorrhage and fibrin in the subretinal space. The optic nerve head itself is quite um, gone. <laughs> uh, so it's quite inflamed and atrophied at this point. So yes, I agree with glaucoma. Um, they did mention systemic hypertension in this dog's history. And when I looked around, this is uh, kind of what I was seeing. So here's a recognizable blood vessel. We got the lumen with some red blood, red blood cells in it. And then we have the wall of this blood vessel. Really the subendothelial space is expanded by some brightly eosinophilic and or pale eosinophilic material. So this is probably proteinaceous fluid or serum. So I would assume this is some sort of insidation of uh, the tunica media of this blood vessel. So that might go along with systemic hypertension. However, this seems quite a bit of an acute lesion mm -hmm. uh, for blood vessels to have sustained rather than like a more chronic one. Um, there were a couple more vessels that were even more affected. And in diabetic, this- Diabetic, right? Yeah, diabetic and had systemic hypertension. So in this one here, I wasn't sure if this was a true vas vascular lesion that was indicative of cardiovascular disease or whether this could have been associated with the necrotic retina. Right. So it's kind of hard to say. Um, <clears throat> and then last but not least, perhaps, um, here's the posterior sclera. There's a de an artifactual defect here. And then here is that suprachoroidal space. So here's the choroid, here's that suprachoroidal space that's expanded by um, a lot of clear space. So there's some edema and then more fibrin and some red blood cells. So that's uh, expulsive suprachoroidal hemorrhage and edema that goes along with a sudden drop of IOP. Uh, sorry, yeah, yeah, decreased IOP that's probably associated with the limbal scleral rupture, I would assume in this case. Um, so this is what you don't want to have happen after cataract surgery. Um, so I still haven't remembered my really profound thought. Oh, well, anyway, so let's talk about what actually I think happened in this eye. I personally think there was poor healing of the surgical site, which allowed uh, bacteria into the eye. And then uh, they set up shop. And that's why the, the animal had uveitis, this eye had uveitis and endophthalmitis. And then personally, I think that all of that bacteria and uh, like neutrophils in the eye led to an inside out scleral rupture, as opposed to, I don't think this was some sort of traumatic event. It could have been. Mm -hmm. Um, but I really think that this was an inside out uh, scleral defect. And actually, when we look at this sclera at the other side, you can see how pale it is and there's a lot of space in there. So I think this is sort of the same thing was in progress on this side of the eye as well. So I think this is just an scleral melting. Yeah, scleral melting associated with all those digestive enzymes of the neutrophils. Um, so. Anyway, kind of a sad case. Um, hopefully the dog's other eye continues to do well. So let's go back to our PowerPoint. So uh, dorsal equatorial scleral defect or limbal, uh, which once again, I thought was inside out, um, severe fibrin or separative hemorrhage, hemorrhagic and necrotizing panophthalmitis and endophthalmitis with intravitreal bacteria, and then corneal epithelial extension into the anterior chamber. There were like 12 more diagnoses, but I figured I'd summarize it here um, with this because I thought that was enough for us in rounds here. Uh, but anyway, any uh, questions or anything in the chat that I should be addressing? Because, you know, so something that I always ask myself is, especially when there's um, um surgical, you know, or uh, the essence or things like that with diabetes, how much the diabetes played a role on the on the you know lack of healing and all, but we just need to learn more about that, especially the effects on the cornea, the effects of brain healing and things like that, because that happens very often. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um they didn't actually tell us uh when the surgery had been done, but in Coplow, whenever we get uh, a post-cataract surgery eye, and they mention uh, how recent it was. If it was within a month, we always try to try, try really hard to sample the incision site. Um, when they're, it's a more recent surgery, 
uh, they're usually a little bit easier to identify grossly. Um, and so uh, we usually try, I mean, because they're only a couple millimeters long. So your general like dorsal ventral cut won't necessarily catch it. Um, so sometimes you really have to aim for it and hope that you get it sampled. Um, so when we have a recent post-cataract surgery eye, especially if there's endophthalmitis, uh, we definitely want to sample that surgical site to be able to make a comment about um, its, uh, its integrity or lack thereof. So we try really hard. This one, I think, was fortuitous that we sampled it because it would have been really hard to identify right. it, I think, given what that globe looked like. So cool. All right. Next case. Moving on. So we actually got a clinical photo of this next one, which is pretty cool. And then we also have a gross photo. So this is a 12-year-old spade female Rottweiler mix. Um, the history we got was um uh, what's that? Yes, I started yesterday. Yeah, right. Isn't it cool though? Yes, yeah, it's so neat to see that. Anyway. Um, so they said slate buthalmus. Uh, this was a blind eye. Um, let's see, your anterior chamber filled by multilobulated and engorged irritable slash uveal tissue, which is in contact with the cornea. Two plus flare with occasional cells were noted in what aqueous was visible. Uh, the lens and fundus are not visible. No lymphadenopathy detected. So um, this is the, the clinical photo that I actually looked at long after the fact when I was writing the case. And I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. But uh, luckily, we also took a gross photo of the eye. And so here is that hemisected globe. Cornea is at the top, as usual. Here's that mass uh, that was just filling the anterior chamber. So we can kind of make out the um, contour of the back of the iris and the ciliary body at the sides. And this mass varies from kind of light brown to off-white. Um, and then let's see here, the lens is actually looking pretty okay. There's a little bit of asteroid hyalosis in the vitreal space. And in the vitreous, the optic nerve is a little bit hard to see, but we did say that it was cupped uh, grossly. Um, so really most of the story is happening up here in the anterior segment. So let's go back to our, all right. So here's the globe. Uh, not surprising, especially given the gross photo that I just showed. All the, the excitement is happening there in the anterior segment. Um, so here's the ciliary body at one side, and you can see there is a hypercellular basophilic population in the ciliary body that then trails off into and expands the iris as well. It also extends a little bit into the limbal sclera on that side of the eye. Um, and... Uh, at this low magnification, you can see how cupped the optic nerve head is. So there's definitely evidence of secondary glaucoma. Well, yeah, let's call it secondary secondary glaucoma there, given the giant tumor that's in the anterior segment. All right. So let's go ahead and jump in there. Okay. So uh, this is a densely cellular population. There are areas of necrosis throughout, and there's some survival around blood vessels. Um, and you can see why all of those blood vessels may have been so obvious in the clinical photo, uh, just because of how dilated they are and congested. Um, and this, uh, so there's definitely uh, significant amounts of necrosis in this uh, tumor. Um, so we're going to go ahead and dive in. So yes, I said it's a tumor, and I meant that. It is a neoplasm that is within and expanding and effacing the iris and the ciliary body. Um, from this lower mag view, you can see that there's um, quite a few pigmented cells around. Um, but when you're in the uvea, you always have to decide whether those are remaining uveal melanocytes or are those the neoplastic cells that actually have that uh, pigment in their tummies, or cytoplasm, rather. Um, and so that is, uh, in Coplow and anyone who does any kind of ocular pathology, we spend a lot of time with tumors like this at HIMAG looking for evidence of pigment in neoplastic cells to try to convince ourselves whether or not we're looking at a malignant melanoma that's poorly pigmented or, um, not. 
Um, so right off the bat, here's a good neoplastic cell who has a uh, nice gigantic nucleo nucleolus there. And he's got at least one dot of pigment in his cytoplasm. And as we look around, you can see other cells that have obviously neoplastic uh, nuclear features that have um, pigment in their cytoplasm. So um, I think this is a really nice example of a poorly pigmented melanoma. And um, as we also look around, you can see that there are quite a few mitotic figures. So pew, pew, pew. Um, so they're all over the place. So just the number of mitotic figures, even in a couple fields here, is consistent with a malignant melanoma. Um, we generally use um, three or greater mitotic figures or four or greater. It varies a little bit. Um, but um, when, so we look for mitotic figures and bump it up to a malignant melanoma if we find a certain number. Um, so the diagnosis here, I didn't think was all that difficult. Um, so I wanted to call this a malignant melanoma. Um, when we tour around the eye a little bit further, um, you can see how it's kind of trailing off onto the ciliary body surface right here. And then even as sort of more individual cells as we work our way further back um, along that surface. So we've got similar kind of spindle cells. And then when we move all the way back to the back of the eye, and you can see how they kind of trail off on the inner retina. They're also here at the back mingling with condensed vitreous and on the surface of the optic nerve head. So this is atypical uh, for the typical for the typical uh, primary uveal melanoma. They don't tend to wander around the eye like this. Um, so my suspicions were heightened, um, but really the history that I didn't give you is even better. Or well, worse for the dog, but better for making a more of a slam dunk diagnosis of a metastatic melanoma. So <laughs> this dog had a history of um, a recent oral melanoma uh, that was surgically excised and radiation therapy was performed on the right side of the mouth somewhere. Um, so I really suspect that this is unfortunately a metastatic lesion that originated in the mouth melanoma. Um, so they didn't mention whether they had staged the patient any further before this or at any time after the or during the bout with the oral melanoma treatment and all that stuff. So I don't know if this dog has lesions elsewhere, but I would strongly recommend uh, staging at this point. So, so there we go, intraocular malignant mel melanoma, clean margins, which is good, but um, I really thought, uh, I differ gave a differential of metastatic versus primary, but I really think this is probably metastatic. It's also possible that do this dog has some propensity for developing melanomas around its body, um, but I've never actually heard any description in veterinary medicine, at least, of a propensity for that. So that is all I have for you. And Jamie is up next. So I apologize that I don't have a gross photo for this case. I didn't really find a good representative photo um, from our archives. Um, so we will just allow you to visualize with your mind's eye as I talk to you about this case. Um, so this um, is the right eye from a one-year-old hound mix, uh, intact male, uh, that comes with a history of a chronic anterior uveitis with secondary glaucoma and was non-visual. Uh, it had moderate to marked boopthalmia. Um, marked diffuse conjunctival and episclera hyperemia, corneal edema with habstria, stria, um, and vascularization uh, of the cornea. Uh, they said the anterior chamber was deep and they weren't able to assess uh, any more posterior structures. Um, in June of this year, uh, CBC chem and a tick-borne panel, brucella and lepto uh, were all within normal limits and they suspected a retinal separation on ultrasound. Um, otherwise, the dog was systemically healthy. 
Uh, they did mark that the other eye, the left eye, is not normal and had a history of previous corneal laceration with lens involvement with a traumatic cataract and was medically controlled for an anterior uveitis of unknown etiology. So, um, so grossly, we did say that the globe was uh, blue thalamic. We'll go ahead and go over here since I don't have a gross picture. Here. We did say the globe was bucthamic, um, that the cornea was cloudy, the uvea and the lens were okay. Uh, we said the vitreous was liquid brown, um, so we can kind of see that indication here um, with the hemorrhage that's in the vitreous. Uh, the retina was detached, and we can kind of see that a little bit here. And we weren't sure about the optic nerve head um, because of the retinal detachment, so we will take a, a look closer. Um, in just a second. Oh, and that the uh, anterior cha chamber does um, contain cloudy gelatinous material. And so we can see some lighter pink stuff in the anterior chamber. <clears throat> All right. All right, so here's our cornea. We can see the... Um, Protonaceous material in the anterior chamber. Uh, as we go along, we notice that there are some breaks in Decimase membrane. Um, this one, let's see, Decimase is intact here, but we do have some fibroplasia kind of deep in the corneal stroma. As we roll around this way. We can see decimase ends kind of here. And the corneal endothelium kind of keeps going. Um, and this deep corneal stroma here has a lot of fibroplasia in it. And then we pick up decimase again over here. Um, so some of these breaks are more actually oriented in the cornea, uh, which is consistent with the habstria that they noted clinically. There's another big one here, um, but some of them did get a little bit more peripheral um, and our peripheral breaks in decimase membrane, uh, we often associate with uh, blunt force trauma. Um, do, do, do. Uh, there is um, a nice robust fibrovascular membrane on the anterior surface of the uh, iris leaflets. Um, and it does come along and run across the uh, anterior lens capsule um, with some hemorrhage and causing some posterior synechia um, of the iris. There is a little bit of posterior migration of the lens epithelium, um, so a posterior subcapsular cataract um, forming. Um, and then a bunch of hemorrhage in the vitreous. Uh, the retina is detached. Uh, we've got some nice tombstoning of the RPE cells um, and um, a little bit of atrophy um, happening and a little bit of some lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate kind of through um, the retina. Um, the optic nerve head, as I said, looked pretty distorted. Um, but the lamina cribosa here is kind of, um, is not quite in line uh, with the um, choroid in sclera anymore. Um, so there's definitely some atrophy here. And then we have, as we keep going deeper, um, this basophilic wispy material um, within the optic nerve itself. Um, so some um, schnabel's cavernous atrophy um, uh, going along with some hemorrhage that's deep here um, in the optic uh, nerve. So um, definitely some, some sort of traumatic event um, leading to all this. And just as a lucky happenstance, we often take um, a third piece of the globe to kind of look at the irritable cornea angles to assess vergonia dysgenesis. Um, here's another peripheral break in decimase membrane. Um, but the reason that this section was so advantageous in this case is if we follow it back 
tap into sample, probably a big reason for all this hemorrhage and stuff in the eye. So, so we have this uh, refractile uh, plant material here um, mixed with a little bit of bacteria uh, surrounded by lots of macrophages. Um, so probably likely a migrating grass on in this uh, young dog. Um, was from California. Um, so definitely a reason to have um, all that intraocular hemorrhage um, in the eye um, to go along with that. So that was just sort of a serendipitous sampling um, because we don't always catch um, the foreign bodies. Um, there wasn't any overt um, rupture or defect um, to the sclera, but um, given the size, it's probably very unlikely that we would have found it grossly. Um, and likely it was um, just migrating, uh, maybe from the oral cavity, potentially. So, um, so we had our um, marked intraocular hemorrhage um, with the uh, foreign plant material and some bacteria um, in the vitreous there. Um, the habstria that they saw clinically with some peripheral breaks that might be more associated with trauma. Uh, maybe um, the doctor saying some blunt trauma to maybe an already blind eye. Um, and our fibrovascular membrane formation with synechia, a retinal detachment and optic hemorrhage, optic nerve hemorrhage to go along with uh, the trauma. So, so just a serendipitous find on our sectioning. It was nice to have. Okay. All right, uh, next up, um, we have um, another sort of exciting case um, about a month ago. A month ago, Coplow received its 100,000th case um, since its, um, I guess, opening with Dr. DeBielzig. Um, so that was very exciting for us to uh, be able to get that eye and process it. Um, so this eye came from a seven and a half year old uh, male neutered uh, domestic short hair cat um, with the history um, of an abnormal iris that the owner initially noted um, in early to mid September, and it progressed rapidly. Um, it was uh, referred to an optim ophthalmologist who agreed that the abnormality was uh, likely an intraocular tumor. So they did an inoculation at the beginning of October. Uh, there were no other uh, general medical health concerns, no history of previous trauma to the eye, um, and the patient was FELV, FIV negative um, as well. So uh, this is our globe. And so we have here our iris that is very thick and kind of irregular and undulant and very white. Um, and we also um, have here in the ciliary body and extending into a core into the choroid um, white uh, mass thickening. Um, the lens itself is kind of cloudy, um, a little bit of light brown vitreous. The retina here is detached. Um, and uh, kind of a question mark on the optic nerve head since we can't really see um, through the retinal detachment. All right. So pretty similar to our uh, gross here. Um, our thickened um, iris here um, is very purple and extends here into the ciliary body and around the choroid and a little bit on this side. Uh, the retina is detached uh, with a little bit of uh, hemorrhage in the subretinal space. Um, here's again that third slice that we like to take sometimes to look at uh, more views of the eye and our lens is artifactually um, outside um, the eye due to uh, processing. Um, which is a, another reason why it's really good to note the lens position when we um, initially cut into it since the lens can move around or be moved um, through the histology uh, process. All right. 
And so here is our uh, mass. Again, just expanding and effacing um, the iris and ciliary and ciliary body and choroid. Um, it is composed of sheets of neoplastic round cells. Um, so we've got um, round cells um, with um, rather large nuclei here um, that are, are round or finely stippled, uh, chromatin, a very prominent nucleus. Um, the nuclei are like at least two times the size of a uh, red blood cell. Um, and there are many, many mitotic figures um, throughout this neoplastic population. Um, I think I got um, like in the 150s on this on this count. Um, so very mitotically active. Uh, neoplasm, um, most likely uh, uveal lymphoma um, for this kitty cat. And then some other changes that we saw, um, the cornea uh, did have um, a superficial ulcer here um, with some flaps kind of lifting up off at the edges. And we can see kind of a, a little bit of, of jumbling and sort of loss of polarity uh, to the epithelial cells from being lifted off here. Um, so consistent with a, a indolent ulcer. Um, as I said, retina is detached um, with hemorrhage associated with it. Um, didn't really get a good sense here of the optic nerve, a um, little bit of gliotic um, in the, or the optic nerve head was a little bit artifactually like detached and sort of separated um, and the optic nerve itself was, was gliotic. Um, but we can again, see the tombstoning um, in the RPE cells and our neoplastic cells here extending into the coron. Yes. Okay. Um, so likely uh, uveal uh, large cell lymphoma, uh, we did offer immunohistochemistry, um, uh, but uh, they did not uh, come back and order it. Um, again, very exciting that this was the 100,000th case that Copla has received. Um, sometimes with um, ocular lymphomas, um, there's a, a fair number of them that uh, when the eye is enucleated, that it is, um, like the, the only evidence of lymphoma in the case, and it's not a systemic disease. Um, and so those are called uh, presumed solitary ocular lymphoma. Um, and those cases usually have a longer median survival time. Um, and the diagnosis of that is sort of dependent on like a complete systemic workup, uh, making sure that there's no um, possible uh, tumor elsewhere um, in, the, in the animal. So um, just a nifty case um, to share with you guys. Turn it over to Dr. Tashira. Okay. <laughs> I got an interesting one for you guys. Um, this is a kitty cat, a domestic short haired cat, seven year, two months old, may neuter. They described basically, so they said posterior to the lens that was fibrin and hemorrhagic strands uh, that were attached to the posterior lens capsule and had a white obstructive opacity. So you can see what they're talking about when you look behind the lens. There's this region right here in the posterior aspect of the lens. And you can see how there is a similar kind of, you know, adjacent similar lesion in the choroid and retina. They do not connect right there. I went back and I took a look at the, the other half to see if there was a connection there. There's not an obvious connection. 
But I mean, they look like they're, you know, pointing at each other in a very mm -hmm. suspicious way. So we'll we'll see what happens. They were not, not able to see the fundus. And on uh, ultrasound, they saw a ventral temple mass near the ciliary body. So they're talking about that. So they saw this and described it as a mass on ultrasound. And they actually saw this on the direct eye exam. Um, other things of notice, anterior segment, relatively quiet. Um, the optic nerve is somewhere around here. And there is these strands, hemorrhage. And so this is retinal detachment. There are some lesions in the choroid. As you can see here, these targetoid type lesions. So this is what we have. Um, oops. Here's the slide. We have a few uh, different levels. Let's start with, uh, you know, let's go with the one of the optic nerve. Yeah, so the reason they've uh, enucleated this eye uh, was just the mass itself. There was no, uh, there were no signs of glaucoma. Um, and with a cat, every time you have a suspicion of a lens capsule rupture or something along those lines, uh, the, there's always the possibility of a post-traumatic sarcoma. So I think that was on the back of their mind when they decided to enucleate this eye. So here's what we have. As you can see um, right away that uh, what they describe as a ciliary body, it's more like a peripheral choroidal mass. It's pretty obvious histologically here from this triangle, you know, and it points towards that lesion in the lens. That is not super obvious, but you can see that there's something extra in the posterior lens cap. So the rest of the eye is quite normal. Uh, all the interior segments. So we're going to focus here in the back. There's some retinal detachment. There's that hemorrhage that we saw grossly. Let's go back. First, I always like to marvel when we see normal irritable coronal angles and optic nerves because we don't get to see them very often. It's a beautiful irritable coronal angle of a cat. All these nice little beautifully dispersed specular ligaments right here. You got your ciliary cleft and the trabecular meshwork. Anyway, that's that. Um, not much going on, as I said. There is a little bit of hemorrhage. So there is a potential space between the end of the asthma's membrane and the peripheral. Uh, uh, cornea and sclera. So things there are in the anterior chamber, they can kind of trickle down in there. But this is not real corneal stromal or scleral hemorrhage. It's just a, that was probably hyphema and the hemorrhage, the replet cells kind of trickle down in there. So we know that there's a little bit of uh, hemorrhage in the anterior chamber. We can see that there's definitely hemorrhage in the posterior chamber and the vitreous. Um, one thing that I debated, so if you look here, Here's the end of the asthma's brain, and here's the base of the iris on this side, right? So pay attention on the distance of the structures here. There's some of the aqueous drainage structures right there. If you go to the other side, that distance is a little bit longer. If you compare, here's the end of the asthma's brain and the base of the iris. And some of the aqueous drainage structures, one might uh, assume or you know uh, interpret that they are more exposed to the anterior chamber. So I debated the possibility of a little bit of angle recession, meaning there was trauma and there was a separation of the base of the iris from the sclera. It's not very often, there's not a lot of reaction around here to suggest that, but um, I guess we'll see why I said that later. Anyway, let's go to the more interesting portion here. So here is that lesion in the posterior aspect of the lens capsule. So let's go back. Uh, yeah, let's try to ignore the artifact or uh, Photoshop everything back together mentally. Here is the lens capsule, equatorial lens capsule. So if you keep following it, actually following it, you get to a point where 
it is unclear if the lens capsule is continuous. There's a fragment here, it stops, there's another fragment. I don't think this is real right away, but there's all this business associated with the posterior lens capsule. If you go to the, if you keep moving around, uh, I've ordered a PES, but I haven't received it yet. Um, there is a very, very thin layer of posterior lens capsule. So it's not very obvious. So I interpret that as being discontinuous. Um, there is migration of the lens epithelium posteriorly, which shouldn't happen. So that's part of a, a cataract exchange. But then, and I'm sorry about my inability to drive diagonally here. <laughs> Blame it on the scope. Yeah, it's the scope. Uh, nothing to do with me. Okay. But um, near to one of these areas where the posterior lens capsule discontinues, you have this tissue that is composed of fusiform cells, few that look a little bit more maybe locuboidal. But there's this matrix in the background. There's what looks like collagen and a thicker matrix, a collagenous matrix that really looks like osteoid mm -hmm. to the point that if you use your imaginoscope, you might interpret some of these as being osteocytes and lacunae. Uh, I did. Oh, that's better. I hope this... Uh, convinces you guys that I, yeah I was doubting myself for a second there uh wondering how much I had to you know how many shots of espresso I had by the point that I made that call but yeah this is osteoid you can even see cells that are, look like osteoblasts there are a few that are osteoclastic looking anyway there's that there is also some hematoidin and some hemosiderin in the background. There's some vessels. So my first reaction was, huh. And that was it. <laughs> and then I'm like, let's uh, look at the rest. I'll come back to this later. So oh, that's what I did. Then if you go back to that region in the choroid, look at that. There's no doubt that that's bone. Right, you can see same osteoid. Now we have mineralized trabeculae. Uh, just to uh, one thing that I think is important is to try to figure out where that is exactly. Not an easy task, but you can see the retina comes all the way there and it stops. Right, this is the tapetum, and we got RPE cells on top. So that's epicoroidal at least at some point. So it's, it's on top of the choroid, but at the same time, the RPE cells they blend with that structure and there are retinal looking fragments of tissue right there. And all of a sudden, right? It looks like trabecular bone and it looks like even bone marrow, right? There's fat. There are, I, I wasn't able to see obvious uh, uh, red blood cell precursors or anything like that. But if I just landed over here, and ask what tissue is this? Where are we in the body? If you said I, I'll be like, <laughs> good job, but I don't know where you got that from. Because uh, this is lamellar bone, nice looking osteoid, uh, osteocytes around, some, sorry, osteocytes in the middle, osteoblasts around, some osteoclasts even, uh, and mineralizing bone trabeculae all the way around. Let's see if this works. If we, Polarize it. Let me polarize this. Oh, look at that. I don't think that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> well, it does polarize here on the microscope, but it just causes uh, some interesting looking. Anyway, polarizes nicely, so it really looks like osteoid. Not that I needed to prove that to you guys at this point. Um, and then it moves into a more collagenous, loose collagenous sort of extracellular matrix with cells in between. Um, if you go deeper on this side, you can see there's retina. So there's definitely pigmented RPE cells, fragments of retina. 
And that tissue is more epicoroidal slash epiretinal than anything else. But in areas like here, it it's hard to tell. You can see some RPE cells still there. And the reason we know, we know these are RPE cells is because if you look closer, you see that they have, and again, imaginoscope on everyone, uh, they have linear melanin granules like that here. Right? So um, the rest kind of looks okay. There's retinal detachment. The retina is somewhat gliotic in that area. Uh, some loss of um, uh, 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 ganglion cells, but I think it's basically because of compression because on the control lateral side of the retina it goes back to normal. So this is interesting. I didn't have kind of a good name for it. Um, there is a possibility that these are contiguous and that's due to a posterior lens capsule rupture and exposure of the lens epithelium. The, in cats, we know that the lens epithelium likes to go, go through um, epithelial to mesenchymal transformation and that's why you have post-traumatic sarcomas and things like that. So it could be that these uh, 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 um, is, um, you know, osteoid or mesenchymal transformation with osteoid formation uh, uh, that's derived from the lens epithelium. Another area where we see um, bone formation or mesenchymal transformation is when there are lesions that affect Brooks membrane, which is this membrane that's underneath the RPE cells. And that's why I made a point out of trying to figure out where this was coming from. This looks more like epi retinal epicoroidal, like on the top of the retina and top of the choroid rather than underneath. But who knows, if you go a little bit deeper, you'll find a, a break in Brooks membrane there. Uh, it doesn't look neoplastic right away. So I did not call this a post-traumatic sarcoma, although it could be a perfect uh, scenario for the development of something like that. There is a version of post-traumatic sarcoma in cats that is basically an osteosarcoma, osteochondrosarcoma. So it could be that that's the precursors of that. Um, so I have to see what I called it because I don't remember. <laughs> Something about bone. Posterior lens capsule defect with lens epithelial fibers metaplasia and heterotopic osteoid deposition. That sounds pretty good. And the second one, focally extensive choroidal, chororetinal heterotropic bone formation with extensive retinal gliosis and atrophy. Idiopathic. So thoughts here could be trauma related. Um, the reason I was actually pointing that angle recession is because we see that with blunt trauma angle recession. So it could be associated with that. Uh, it could also be a remnant of a uh, fetal vasculature. Like we see a, you know, a, Persistent fetal vasculature. Sometimes we get um, osteoid or, or or fibrous metaplasia. Uh, sometimes uh, formation of uh, even you know adipose transformation or or other types of mesenchymal tissues with persistent fetal vasculature. But uh, we don't know. Uh, that's the the kind of the end. Uh, where, where, where we, we, we left it there. The important thing is that this is not neoplastic at this point. Yeah, we do have a question. Uh -huh. If we know that, the, if, do we know the patient's chemistry uh, wondering about calcium phosphorus levels? Mm -hmm. um, we don't, Okay, but that's a good question. Yeah, there's nothing here uh, mentioned on general medical conditions rather than just the uh, ophthalmic exam. That stuff, that'll be good to know. Cool. All right. This is next one. Uh, it's a American Bulldog mix. Seven years of age, female spade. Uh, they described anterior viatis post cataract surgery, retinal detachment, and chronic glaucoma. The reason I brought this one is more because of the gross appearance of this than anything else. So this is a cataract surgery. We don't know when the surgery was done. I would love to know that um, because what we can see here, well, there's a little bit of hemorrhage. That's the least of it. But if you look around, you see where the lens was or, you know, the, the lens capsule is still there. So there, there was no IOL in this case. So they, um, 
It's not, it was not an uh, intracaps or lens extraction because the lens capsule is still here. So I think they did FACO and they decide not to put an IOL inside. Uh, so there's no uh, lens in there. But what we have is this cute looking lens capsule with these two round structures at either equator, right? This is called a uh, submarine's ring cataract. I have another example that I found from an older case, why it's called a ring. Um, it, it's a little bit at an angle, right? So if we look straight down here, what you would see would be just a, both ends like we are seeing here, right? But if you tilt it a little bit, you get the whole ring, which is pretty awesome in this case. And what happens is the um, when you do cataract surgery in younger animals, younger dogs, younger cats, their uh, lens epithelium is way more active than normal. So if you don't clean it up completely, the uh, lens epithelial cells, especially at the equator where the equatorial bowl is, will start growing again and they will reform uh, um, lens material, right? And since, you know, you go there with a phaco and that I'm going to be very technical here in terms of my surgical lingo here, <laughs> going there and you suck everything out, I go... I don't know if that's how it sounds, but that's how I imagine it. Right. Nice. And it's coming up. Cool. When you're sucking it out, if you don't completely take out all the lens epithelium, especially in younger animals where their cells are still very active, it will regrow. And it will regrow at the equator, and it forms a nice looking ring like this. Right, so this is what we have here. It's called a submarine's ring cataract. And the um, reason I brought the other one is because this one, it's not super well sampled, uh, but that other one is. So here is what it looks like. And again, kind of the Jewish thing. And there was glaucoma, there was secondary glaucoma. That's boring, we don't care about it. Um, because fibrovascular glaucoma, post-surgical. What's that? The Durex is on the condenser. Oh, yeah. <laughs> nice. You got COVID. You got COVID. <laughs> no, I'm not, I, I'm supposed not to be more infectious. That's my 11th day. So. All right. So here's what we got. Unfortunately, this is all that we got from Badlands. Um, and there's retinal detachment and atrophy. There's a little bit of right here. But let me show you, and then I'll, I'll go back to the other case, which is much better. Here it is. So as I mentioned, it is right at the equator. And how do we know that? Because you can see the lens capsule going from anterior, lens capsule thick to thin. And there is some regrowth of the lens epithelium. Even you can see some epithelial cells migrating inwards and some uh, more gagging and globules, et cetera. Now, Let's take a look at the other example, the other case, the older case. So the other case was a, a younger dog. This one is a seven-year-old dog. That's why I wanted to know when it was done. The other dog was uh, three years of age, and he had cataract surgery done two years prior. So he was kind of a year old. So that makes sense. So here is the other case, and this is pretty. Right, so remember that donut looking structure. So here's one end of the equator where you have like a teeny tiny lens. So you can see the anterior lens caps is rounded up. There is the capsulotomy site to come around and you get a posterior lens capsule right here and the regrowth of lens fibers. Here it is. Oops, sorry about that. There's some posterior synechia. Also, you can see some fibro, some pigmented fibrovascular membranes. And if you look at the other side, here is the other end of it. Even more impressive with some mineralization of the lens regrowth. And as I said, at, right at the equator, thicker anterior lens capsule to a thinner posterior lens capsule. And there it is, Summering's ring cataract. Dr. Summering decided to squeeze his name in it, uh, and a beautiful retinal detachment and tear and atrophy and retinal schizis all are very good uh, post-cataract uh, surgery types of lesions.
So I'll leave you guys at that. And there's that. There we go. Um, and uh, see you guys in two weeks. Thanks for joining us today. Thank mm -hmm. you.